Okay. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the City of Farmers Branch study session meeting. It is Tuesday, March 22nd, 2022. The time is 2 p.m. We will begin with A1, discuss regular agenda items. Council Member Rotana. Uh, none for me, sir. Thank you. None for me. Is there any, any items you'd like to discuss? Uh, yes, please. So... I have a question on H2. Let me just get to that. So in regards to that, uh, I wasn't exactly clear why the fire chief is being removed. Is it because we have an emergency management uh, person? Oh, history, it's always been under the fire chief. Yes. And uh, with the new transition that we're going through, uh, it was felt to be better to put it underneath me and the mayor appoints okay. that individual. Take it out from underneath the fire chief. I see. Okay. That's all. Thank you for clearing that up. Yes, okay. Um, on H5, so a couple questions in regards to H5. So we uh, we did approve the budget for the charging stations. Correct. Okay. So it is is it still our intent? One, to give away free electricity to anybody who wants to charge a vehicle? So um, that's up to our discretion. Um, we have the capability to charge a fee for the usage. As of right now, we don't. Um, with the chargers that are currently at City Hall, we don't have that capability. Every charger we purchase now, we will have that ability. Okay. And uh, the $153,000 that's an additional expense to what we've already approved. So we Correct. approved the 223. So this is the H5 is for the electrical infrastructure, basically capacity running the, the line, the conduit. Um, H6 is the one which is the actual charger and the installation. So H5 is making the spot EV ready. H6 is putting that charger right on top. Okay, but we're still budgeted for this. You're producing the budget. Yeah. Budgeted 223, and this is 211. Yes. Included a both items. Both, both items. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. No okay. And then uh, I read where uh, uh, the warranty on the uh, boxes was going to be void if you had if you drill through to put uh, conduit into them. So is there a way to uh, still have warranties? In fact, y'all. That's something I'll have to work with facilities on. The knock box, the cutoff <laughs> switch. Um, that's. And I guess an ordinance for fire prevention, so they can turn it off. So we'll have to work with facilities to see how we can maintain that warranty when it's installed. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Thank you. That's all I had on that. And um, then on H seven, I'm assuming that uh, transfer to the to an HOA's board will take place when uh, all of the units have sold? When the majority of the lots are sold. Majority? Okay. That's what I want to find out. Thank you. Councilman Merrick. Uh, just a couple uh, today. On H3, uh, amending the absences, I have a question about the 25% a rule how do how are we going to address some of those boards and commissions who meet very infrequently say less than four times a year because obviously the uh, the math would be uh, problematic at 25 percent if you met less than four times a year and I didn't see a stipulation that it's applicable to four times a year or based on four times a year so yeah, and, Amy correct me if I'm wrong but of our standing committees the one that meets the least is going to be the, the Animal Advisory Board, which is currently four times a year. I believe they're going to be expanding that, but that's the reason we put more than 25%. So effectively, you'd have to miss 
fifty percent of the animal advisory board's meetings right. to be kicked off. Yeah. So the underlying assumption is that we're going to have at least four meetings for all of the boards and commissions. I think that's what we're trying to uh, express. Okay. That that's fine. Thank you for that clarification. Um, I have a question on H four. Uh, this being on the license plate readers. Um, we're doing two intersections. Um, who am I speaking? One of the officers. Yes, sir. Two intersections. Yes. Um, Twelve license plate readers. Are right. they being distributed equally? Yes, or? sir. One okay. for each lane. That's that's the way that it works. <coughs> okay. Out. So you one. have six at one intersection, six at the other. That an that answers the question. I just want to uh, make sure that I understood how that was being transferred. So that's it. And then lastly, my question is on H eight. Uh, related to the uh, printing agreement on utility billing and mailing services. Uh, what are we, are we saving money going this route? I read the exp I read the explanation that we were spending 65,000 in or 63,000 in order to get to that. <laughs> there we are. Hi. Hello. That's, what, that's where I was pointing. <laughs> so are we saving, are we saving money? Compared to what? What are we spending now for this? Oh, doing it okay. in house. So no, we're not doing. This is the company that we're using now. This is just an extension of okay. the agreement. I I did not read that clarification in there. Okay, so we're now going on to. Are we paying less the, than we are currently playing with this particular company? No. Going forward to the program that City of Plano has. No. We are currently under an uh, interlocal agreement with Plano, and this contract basically extends that in an interlocal agreement with Plano. The um, pricing is currently the old pricing was ten and a half cents. Yeah, so this so changes it to so, eleven. Cents. Okay, but this is an annual renewal then. It's is that, um, it's, it's actually renewed really every three years or okay. so. Yeah. So it's a renewal of that underneath that. Okay, fair enough. Thank you so much. Thank Sorry you. to. No worries. Thank you for mind, I believe that includes postage, right? It does. No, no the postage. The well, postage. the postage would be additional. Uh, this is the printing. Yeah, this is the printing um, and the mailing. And mailing. Okay. That's all I have. The other comments will come in public hearing and regular agenda downstairs. Thank you. Thank you. Next is A2, received biannual update from the Senior Advisory Board. chair of the senior advisory board at the branch connection and I'm here to present our biannual report um, wow it's hard to believe that it's been six months since the last time I was here but as they say time flies when you're having fun and we've been having a lot of fun at the branch connection and I'm so glad that you all are here to share with me the biannual report let me see if I can work this you set up there we go our board members. Um, we unfortunately lost one of our longtime board members last fall, Johnette Henderson. Um, great lady, we miss her, but uh, we did replace her and we are nine strong again and really, really busy. I mean, we were going to um, Try not to have a, a meeting in January, you know, after the holidays, but we had so much going on that we just couldn't. So we had an, a meeting in January, um, a lot of activities in February. And I also was thinking the other day about our accomplishments as board members. So many of our board members volunteer for so many of our events that we sponsor and, um, and at other events that we have throughout the year. But I was thinking about Ruth Foles, who is here today, and I've got five board members here who have joined, well, five board members who have joined me today. Um, Ruth Foles was a Charlie Bird Spirit uh, Award winner, but on our board we have three Charlie Bird Award winners on our current board right now. So I would say that's quite an accomplishment. 
We do have 12 meetings a year. Our attendance is wonderful. We have no attendance issues with our um, board members and great group of people, great group of people to work with. <coughs> our mission and vision, um, keep plugging away. We, we try to improve on a daily basis, follow the mission and the uh, vision statements. Um, this is a great segue into working with others. We had our own little March Madness last week. We had our sweet 16 volleyball teams, uh, cheer volleyball teams, come to the Branch Connection, hosted a volleyball tournament, and I don't know if all of you know, but we were number one. It was it was a hard fought competition. Man, that Carrollton team was a was they were tough, but we beat them and we. 5.30 that afternoon, Friday afternoon, we won. So, and there was, I'll tell you, there was some madness there. <laughs> but all in all, it was great. It was a long day, but you cannot believe how many people said, thank you so, so much for hosting this. We've had such a great time. It had been three years since there had been a volleyball tournament. Just, you know, we love your facility. We just... Thank you so much. Just so many people. Compliments all the way around. So we had a great time. And we won. That was the best thing. Um, our membership continues to increase. And I'll be real honest. I'm not a real... I got my degree in medieval British history. Okay, so, <laughs> so statistics just, you know, kind of for me. And Jackie, I swear I try and listen to all your presentations on everything. But with COVID, you know, when we're closed, and it's kind of a little bit difficult to, like, compare things. But I'm a bottom line person. If you're winning and numbers are up, then you're doing a great job. And let's continue to do that. If the numbers are down, What's wrong? How do we fix it? So, bottom line person that I am, <coughs> this is where we are in terms of our membership, which is at 12% in the first quarter. Everything else, as you can tell and you can read, is up. Um, our membership continues to grow, so I think we're doing a good job as far as the membership. Um, yeah, I'm real pleased. Jackie, I did pay attention to that. Examples of our success. Well, second cons uh, se second year that we have won the Traps um, Award for our fishing fund, which is coming up, and we still need volunteers. Um, April the 30th, a uh, great event. As most of you have been there know, it's just wonderful, and we love it. Um, Ruth Bowles, again. Ruthie, stand up, because you deserve this, darling. Ruthie's off to Paris, France tomorrow. <laughs> Ruthie is the 2021 Charlie Bird Spirit of Service Award, and I've got to read this. I'm so sorry, so I don't mess up. The 2021 DFW Director Supreme Service Awardee. So we just are so proud of Ruth. And she also is a volunteer at the front desk, and she stood the whole time for that volleyball tournament last week, working as a line judge or referee or I'm sorry I was in the other part of the room I didn't know, but she worked it and stood every time I saw her Ruthie was standing up we had our craft fair we reinstated that in the fall we had 58 vendors and over 500 participants it was a great day of course our game night our big night our that's our big gala um, we sold over 200 tickets and raised over $10,000 in contributions. Did another great job. It was great. It was a fantabulous night, actually. Um, we had our Valentine's show this past February, and we sold out over 125 tickets. Great show again. Um, we had a Beatles cover band that played Beatles love songs, and it was really great. Continue to add to our programming, um, expanding our programming, um, our fitness, educational, just across the board, as you can tell, we continue to expand and, and just, people are just glad to get out. They're glad to be here. They're so glad to be out. And of course, we had our Super Bowl Live event, which was also great. They're all, they've just been all wonderful. All right, so in the future, our Spring Branch Bazaar is going to be in April? March April. 
March, April, and May. We're bringing them that back. Our fishing fun event, like I mentioned, we're going to be um, April the 30th. And again, continue to increase programming and awareness in the community. And um, last but not least, we have plans to renovate our facility at this time. And we're excited about it. We really are. We've just been <coughs> not making a big production about it because I have appointed a committee, a renovation committee, and they will work hand in hand with um, the Parks and Rec Department to see what we can do and spread the word. I told that I told them. I said you need to stay positive, stay focused, keep going. And you know, one of the things that I've really noticed up at the Branch Connection, I've been on in this position nine months is people just want to talk and they want you to listen and they don't want you to be looking at your phone or see who if anybody better came in behind you or whatever you know they just want to listen uh, want you to listen to them and I think with this renovation project that's something that we're going to do because oh you know we're going to get some <laughs> it's going to be a lot of discussion but we just need to keep keep our eye on the prize as they say I hate to use that cliche but anyway I mean that's that's what we're going to do and it's going to be great I'm just I'm so excited about it um and last but not least same questions Miss Hall thank you very much for your leadership uh it's exciting to see all the amazing things that continue to happen at the branch connection and we too are excited about the the renovations so looking forward to what the team comes up with and their ultimate ideas and how that facility is going to shape out over the next few years. But with that, does uh, anyone have any questions at this time? No other questions. No, thank you. Mine. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks so much for listening. And I hope I didn't want to word you, but <laughs> I wanted to let you all know that we're just doing great things over at the French Connection. Keep it up. Thank you, Doug. Next is A3, receiver report on the mandatory crime reduction program <laughs> for designated apartments for calendar year 2021. Right. Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see everyone. Got a, got a full house. So I'm David Hale, police chief. If you didn't, if you ha if we haven't met, so I'm going to be talking about the mandatory crime reduction program uh, for uh, our multifamily apartments in the city. Uh, it uh, was uh, established by ordinance number 3477. So a little bit of a going back to talk a little bit about what the program is about. So uh, an apartment complex is considered anything that has at least 10 dwelling units. Anything below that would not uh, be considered in this program. Um, when we're talking about uh, crime data associated with the program, uh, the uh, crime must occur in the complex or be traced to the complex premise and, a re and a result in an arrest or an offense report. <clears throat> crimes that are a result of a transition into the complex from from the roadway which is our normally that would occur from us uh, doing our jobs out there if we happen to pull somebody over as an example they end up in the apartment complex we end up making a narcotics arrest because we found uh, narcotics in the vehicle that is not held against the complex because that we're the ones that that made that happen So what are the applicable crimes um, that we utilize uh, for the program? Uh, of course, the big ones, uh, murder, sexual assault, robbery, uh, aggravated assault, bur burglary, theft, auto theft, and uh, I, I, I won't read the, the whole thing, uh, but disorderly conduct is also an, uh, an important one because of the public place, uh, the public areas uh, located in our apartment communities. So non-applicable crimes, uh, domestic violence, which is an assaultive offense, 
that takes place behind closed doors and it's very hard for the apartment complex to impact that. Uh, so we don't hold uh, folks accountable for that. Fraud, uh, possessing and receiving stolen property, and uh, other status offenses. And an example of a status offense is runaway. <clears throat> it's important to note that violent crimes, obviously, uh, you know, property crimes bad enough, but if you have a violent crime, uh, that's going to count double in our calculations because we want to make sure that we're uh, impacting the quality of, of life uh, for the residents. So a little bit about how the calculation occurs. Uh, the uh, crime index, um, you divide ap applicable crimes occurring in the complex uh, by the total number of units and then divide by 100. Um, the residential crime index is uh, divide all of the applicable crimes for a single family residence by the total number of single family residences. <coughs> and then again, multiplying by 100. So we're, we're trying to create an environment in our co apartment communities that is no different than, than any other neighborhood that you live in. And that's why we make this comparison. The crime risk safety thresholds is multiply the residential crime index by two. And again, violent crimes are, are weighted double for both index calculations. So, um, Mandatory Crime Reduction Program, once you are considered included into the program, uh, the, the apartment complex must uh, implement the following, a crime for release addendum, quarterly crime watch meetings, criminal background checks for prospective residents, which they should be doing anyway, uh, be a part of the Farmers Branch Police Department criminal uh, trespass program, uh, do a residential security survey, and a $2,000 program fee, and you must remain in the program for, for one year. So there is an appeal process uh, for those who are considered, uh, who are in the program. Uh, they, uh, an apartment complex may appeal designation into the program uh, as, as a repeat offender within 10 days of being notified. Appeals to be heard by the or to be heard by the uh, City of Farmers Branch Zoning Board of Adjustments (CBA) within 60 days of notification of the appeal to the City Secretary. Uh, the CBA is just limited in the determination as to whether or not our calculations were correct and that they do meet the that they did meet the threshold for the uh, to be in the program. And uh, you may may appeal to Rafita Pender. Uh, program requirements for variance, Econo economic hardship is not a consideration. So who's in the program for, uh, and this is going to be for 2022, but it's uh, the calculations are from calendar year 21. Alvista Galleria at 13505 Inwood Road, Brookhaven Apartments at 14800 Marsh and Prairie Crossing at 4000 Sigma. And uh, again, here is the uh, here's the data. This is how we look at all of the different uh, apartment complexes and uh, and determine what the uh, threshold crime threshold is. And then obviously those that fall, fall above uh, that average are considered to be a part of the program. Any questions in regards to those in the program, how we get there? Go ahead. I have a question. Um, thank you so much for, for the update. Um, I know that generally there's been an uptick in just in debt and, and, you know, and I think that's something that's across the Metroplex. But I guess my question is um, related to that. You, you mentioned that they have to be in the program for a year. Um, and I'm assuming that's a year of when they were um, established within the program, correct? Yeah, it's calendar year. A calendar year. Mm -hmm. So if they got in the program August 1st, 2022, then they'd be um, subject to enter or continue to be a part of the program August of 2023, for example. It, it, it resets every January. Okay, so that, that, that that's right. my question. So it's not when you entered the program. It's if you entered today, for example, March 22nd, you'd have to be there through January 1st. Correct, but we, we do it in January every year anyway. Okay. 
Well, I'm just now making the presentation, sure. but they've already had the notifications. Okay, so you saw the trends, um, let's say fall of last year, and you made the decision that in January, these individuals, due to the, that, the data that's shown, they're now in the program and they'd be from January through December. Yes. Based and on then the at which point, if the data continues to show the same trends and they would have to continue to be a part of the program until that, until that, that those numbers go down. Correct. And then they would be considered a repeat offender at, okay. after that. So they would go in for the year two and then there's a <laughs> repeat offender process. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Lynn. Chief, um, I didn't know whether to ask, that, ask my question this section or, or the next item, but um, I'll ask it now. Do you have any data or do you know if any of the statistics that you have listed on the chart correlate to short-term rentals of apartments? I don't have that data. Okay, that's fine. I just was curious. Does anyone else have any, any questions? Chief, obviously, the line of demarcation at this point looks like it's 6.4, uh, twice the residential average. Um, being a numbers guy, do we notify those folks that were very close, like the 6.3? We do not at this point. Okay. Might be a good idea going forward to let them know that they were very close. We can, we can make that happen. Thank you. Does anyone? I have one more. Oh, sorry. Um, okay, two questions. <laughs> uh, and this kind of is a follow up to uh, Councilman Lynn's question. There's Prairie Crossing in particular has 13 short term rental applications that are in process right now. Uh, and my, my question here is and, and, and currently that is allowed, um, and the management is aware of that. Uh, my, my question here is uh, one of the points you mentioned is that they have to, if they're, once they're in the program, they, the, the, the tenants have to meet the criminal background check. My guess is the short-term rental subletting group is not doing that. So uh, you may want to get together with our building inspection folks to make sure they're aware of that so we can notify the short-term rental company accordingly. Absolutely. Because that would preclude yeah, that from happening. Uh, the second thing is it's the, the, the trio of apartments you have here, two are fairly new, and one is fairly old. Is there a common characteristic amongst the three that has led them to this life of crime? Gen generally, pro <laughs> what it, it's generally property crime. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, stuff. A, a good example is, uh, I think it's Alvista that has, they have a room for the convenience of their, of, of their uh, the people who live there. And it is full of bicycles. It's for pl a place for people to store bicycles so that they don't get stolen off the porch. At, at one point, that was getting propped open, left open, and people were going in and dealing with, you know, and, and helping themselves to the bicycles. So it, as when we do our inspections and we go in and look and make recommendations, it's like, hey, you got to fix this because this is what's causing you to have to be in the program. I mean, you know, there's some things that are harder to control, but that is definitely something that you can fix. I have one more question. Um, so from a timeline perspective, if just to be clear, so they, um, you go through the data, do you have them, and in January you make the decision, like in this case, Alvista, Brookhaven, and Prairie Crossing were a part of the program. Do you have a meeting prior to making that determination with the entity to let them know, by the way, we did, we did this, um, we, we looked at the data, you know, come January, we're going to have to enter you into this to start that process of conversation, or do you wait until after they're already you already decided they're in the program to um, to have meetings with with these entities? We have we have it afterwards only only because um, we can kind of tell, but I'd hate to go to a place and then you know the last three days of the year they end up having all of these things that may that they may or may not be in the program, and so. That, that's probably the only explanation I would have as to why we wouldn't do that. Uh, but we could say, hey, look, things are looking this way. Uh, uh -huh. But, you know, anything can happen. You know? Sure. Um, have, have, uh, has your team had meetings yet with all of these individuals? Yes. Okay. 
Well, and I guess that, that just is a follow up to my question. It, is there an education component to being part of this program where where you guys go in and say, look, this is this is where the, these crimes are happening. These are our recommendations on how you can help resolve this you know will if we need to add you know you know y'all more people to your beat we will do that or um how do we work with them to get them out of the program that following year and that is absolutely our goal they are not left on the island because part of this is back on us i mean at the end of the day we we need to help them you know with whatever issues and so we play a role as well and so, no, it's, they're, they're not left, left on an island and saying, okay. okay, this is all you. We're there every step of the way to help them Perfect. make recommendations on what they should be doing. And, and also, again, playing our part to make sure that we're, we're patrolling the areas we need to be patrolling. Perfect. And the ordinance that we're about to talk about um, uh, on the apartment safety, uh, multifamily safe, safety, um, have we taken data from this program to build into that ordinance? Um, our ordinance on recommendations for, you know, where we place cameras, where we're, you know, have y'all worked? Perfect. Perfect. Okay, I have one more follow-up. I'm sorry. Hold on, uh, Councilmember Lane. Oh, sorry. Question, okay. Go ahead. Keith, uh, one more question. It, I guess it's follow-up to what Charles had asked. So, I haven't rented an apartment for many, many years, so I don't know. Is a background check standard procedure for getting a lease? Yes, and I can speak from the experience because I put my way through college being working in apartment complexes. And so even way back then, that was a big part. That was a big, that was, that was something that we did. Okay. So just from my experience, yes, it's a standard procedure. Okay, then that answers my second part. So thank you. Councilmember Rotano. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> sorry, and one last question related to the procedures. Um, you know, I know that you all have, uh, you know, meetings with the property managers on an ongoing basis related to crime and you all send crime reports and whatnot. Um, do you all do, and I know other cities that I've worked with in my career have done this, um, do you all do uh, kind of mid-year reporting um, with, the, with the apartment complex? So, for example, for um, all this, you know, let's say in July you send out the crime report and you saw that the statistics kept growing. Do you have a conversation with them at that point, at a mid-year point or whatever point, to let them know, by the way, you may be at risk of having to enter into this program and work with them to help mitigate some of those things? Or is it more ad hoc? Is there something established, or is it just on a one-on-one -on -one basis? We, we currently are not meeting meeting with anybody midstream. And again, because the calculations go all the way to December 31st. Oh, sure. but. It's not a bad idea because yeah. you can kind of see the direction it's going. It could change toward the end. It can. But, but just because it hasn't doesn't mean that, you know, we could, you know, engage somebody. Yeah, and that would be my recommendation only because, you know, these apartment complexes, they don't want to be a part of this. I mean, they don't want to be seen as, as, a, as a complex that has high crime. And so if there's anything from your perspective, since y'all are out there and y'all see everything, um, letting them know that hey, may, maybe a mid-year type of reporting to where you see that the trends are going up and they are and they continue to go up so that way they can try and, and mitigate and do some of these implement some of these things before they actually you know enter the program so that would just be a, a recommendation um, to explore again I think they would appreciate it um, so they would they won't be you know listed under this mandatory crime prevention program because obviously I don't think anybody wants to be a part of that list um, so just a recommendation. Thank you, no, Chief. Thank I appreciate you. it. We, we don't want anybody in the program. Exactly. <laughs> thank you. And a lot of times they don't know what they don't know. So sure. it's really nice to have the experts kind of advise. Thank you. Chief, I participated in a crime watch meeting at Mustang Station where I live. And Officer Rutherford did go over our crime stats at that time. So I would bet when he's out doing a crime watch meetings at the, at the invitation of the complexes, they'll go over that kind of information. But we could probably formalize that. Yeah, and I think in my, in, you know, even at the Brickyard, I think it's just when it's requested, it's not something that's actually on the calendar, but maybe having it to where at least once a year, regardless if you request it or not, you make that um, offer to the complexes. Because one of the things that I found in working in these cities is they don't know they can even, some of them, some of the property managers change so much. Some of them are new. They don't even know that they can request that. And so being able to have that conversation and let them know. But but I agree, you know, with the ones that do, do a really good job of, of offering that. And we and since we already have, have the lists, yeah. you know, anyway, for, for doing mailings, that would be easy to say, hey, 
here you go, you know, this is the trend, this is where things are looking, we'd like to, have, we'd like to reach out to you. Mm -hmm. Councilman Merrick? Yeah, just to follow up on Councilwoman Rotana's uh, comment about awareness and what they can and can't do, does the city program require the apartment complex management to produce a program or a project of what they're going to do. Obviously, they're having to do some of the things that you talked about, the lease and the crime watch meetings, et cetera. But if they're doing other things, how are they communicating that? And do we kind of open that dialogue when they enter the program, I guess? There, there's a, sure, when it's just like we don't, we obviously recommend what the ordinance says. Correct. You know, to, to begin with. But if there are other ideas that come forward, either through that mutual conversation, then we would definitely help them, you know, okay. facilitate or get, or, you know, to get that in that, go in that right, in the right direction. From a program, from a project manager standpoint, it would be seemingly wise for the city to ask for them to have a project plan on how they are going to address that. And when are they going to have their quarterly meetings? When are they going to do their processes? of improving in order to get out of the program statistics so sure. again that's just another suggestion and we do follow up we don't leave them on their own understood yeah you've, you've mentioned that chief so thank you councilman Lynn. one last comment uh, maybe maybe we could consider uh, introducing like a gold star safety award program for complexes that are safe and you're you're part of the uh, gold star group if you will uh until you start having incidents and then you lose your rating and then you lose your star yeah that might be something to consider as a inducement to for them to do what they need to do any more questions all right chief thank you thank you chief Next is A4, re review draft ordinance number 3734 for the enhanced apartment complex security requirements. deleted my presentation chief no just <laughs> good afternoon everyone I'm uh, Leo Bonanno for those of you that don't know me I'm the deputy director of neighborhood services and um, following up on what the chief uh, just went through, uh, I'm here to propose uh, a new ordinance for you to address some of the, um, some of the crime matters um, that we seem to be facing. Um, I just wanna go over very quickly some of the material that you were given today just to make sure you understand what you were given. Uh, I'm gonna mention a presentation I gave to apartment complex managers and owners. Every apartment complex manager and owner was invited to a presentation um, with a draft of the new ordinance. And that's what this looks like. So that's what they, that's the presentation I went through with them. Also, um, Officer um, Stephen Rutherford did that with me, um, the crime prevention officer. Um, so uh, shout out to him for helping me there. Um, and then this is the presentation we're about to go through very quickly. And then finally, this is the draft that you're, you're currently looking at. So how this works is a draft, a draft present, uh, excuse me, a draft ordinance was presented to the complex owners and managers in this document. And it contained everything, everything but the kitchen sink. It just, every idea that we thought was good went in there. And when I say we, I mean myself, the police department, the fire department, planning, building inspections, permitting. We got, uh, even IT helped us. Uh, Mr. Samuels, uh, you, you probably read about security cameras, got his input on security cameras. So the draft that you see here um, was a culmination of work by, by a number of departments. And so um, that's what I presented to the apartment complex managers. 
And so here's a little bit of that information. Like I just said, that occurred on uh, January 28th. Um, 19 individuals from 13 different complexes came. Uh, we do have about 46 complexes in the city overall uh, and some more on the way. Um, so uh, just for, for a frame of reference. And so this presentation is going to go over a little bit of the feedback that we heard from the apartment owner slash manager presentation and then um, ask you for feedback. That's one of my big goals for today is we have a place to start, but this language does not exist. So I'm in need of some guidance to, um, to help us get in the right, um, to, 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 to get to a goal where, where we're all happy. Um, and so that's, that's a big part of today. So let me run through this quickly, real easy. Um, based on the feed, uh, excuse me, the presentation that I gave to the apartment managers and owners, this is the general feedback that we received. And I can go, um, uh, I'm sorry, let me back up. Let me read these to you, and if you'd like, I can give you my responses to them. I don't know if you're interested in that at this time, but let me at least make sure that, that you're aware of what their feedback was. Uh, some of the common ones were the security systems, uh, adding security systems would require uh, more action uh, and staff by the apartment complex. The common um, theme there was you're asking us to be police officers. That's, that's where that was kind of headed. Um, another one was security systems are too expensive. Can the city financially assist complexes with the cost of new systems? Uh, can you push back the deadline of compliance? The original deadline I assigned, some folks felt was too soon, and so they asked that it be pushed back. And can council members visit some complexes before they decide on what the new, um, the new requirements for security will be? Uh, I, did, uh, I do have answers to these, um, if you'd like to hear them, or I can press on. Uh, would anyone like to hear them? Yeah, yeah? okay. Um, um, well, like I said, um, so the, the security systems lead to, um, lead to a need for more action and staff. Um, that is, uh, I, I classify that as a knee-jerk reaction. Um, folks know that they will have to spend money. This is an investment in your property, and you'll have to spend money to make it happen. Well, some folks went a little bit too far, and you're asking us to be police officers. You're asking us to have someone monitor computer monitors and security cameras all day, and that's not the case. Um, security cameras, as they're described in the ordinance, are meant, A, to be a deterrent for crime, and B, a collector of evidence uh, if a crime should occur. We are not asking anyone to put on a badge and, and, uh, and be a police officer. We're not asking anyone to sit in a locked room uh, with a wall full of monitors and stare at screens. No one asks that. Um, but that's where some folks' minds went automatically. Um, security <laughs> systems are too expensive. Uh, this was an interesting conversation. Uh, not everyone agreed in the room. Security systems, cameras especially, have gone way down in price as they have become more accessible. Um, there, were, there was a time when the thought of having a security system around your home was, was kind of ridiculous. Well, who would have cameras around their home? But they're so accessible and frankly so affordable that anyone can presumably do it. And although we did have some folks comment, you know, I have a big complex, and that means a lot of cameras, and I'm concerned about the cost. And we did have some of that, and I'm not saying that that's not a genuine comment. We did have others that said, I already have some cameras, so coming up to the new standard won't be so bad for us. I heard that. I also heard our rent is up. Our rent in revenue is up. We can afford this. I actually had someone say it out loud, which I thought was very brave, in a room in a room full of ma managers and owners. So, but it, but it was great because they because they did illuminate the other side of the argument. Uh, home prices are up, and your revenues are up, and we know that. So, um, again, a little bit of a knee jerk reaction, perhaps. But some folks saw we were headed, and some folks flat out said, "We can afford this. This is a good thing." We I did hear that during the presentation. Uh, can the city financially assist complexes? My answer to that was, um, I am not aware of any plans to do so at this time. So that was just a general kind of answer. Um, it's private property. Uh, I did not see that happening. No one's mentioned that to me. So that was my answer to them. 
um, push back the deadline for compliance. Um, this was actually something I agreed with. My original deadline for compliance in this document, you'll see, was at the end of this year. You had to be in compliance with a new security system by the end of this year. Well, some folks did mention, you know what, we're already, we've already got our budgets for this year approved and kind of set, and this is an expense that could be major. Can we push it back? And I thought that was valid. So the, the, the draft, the, the new document that you're looking at, actually has pushed the date back to the end of next year. So that was, that was a bit that I thought was, was pretty valid. Uh, can council members visit some complexes before they decide on new requirements? My answer was yes. Uh, I don't make anybody do that. <laughs> so um, I said that they are free to visit whatever properties they wish, whenever they wish. I have a contact list of all the owners and managers, and if any of you would like to schedule appointments to visit any complexes, maybe even some the chief mentioned uh, as part of the mandatory crime prevention program, uh, I have contacts for those um, property managers. So if you like, you can schedule an appointment with them, but obviously that, that wouldn't involve me. You can do that yourself. So those were kind of the big, the big five that we heard during the session. And again, the, um, based on the feedback, we, I converted the original draft, the blue document, to the draft that we have now before us. So that is what I'm asking for you today, is to share some feedback on it. Uh, uh, several things were removed, as I mentioned. Um, we did have, when the legal department reviewed it, there was a legal issue, issue or two that came up, and we solved those, I believe. Um, it had to do with turning over of recordings in the case of an incident, and, and we resolved that. Uh, so, so what we have now is a pretty good skeleton, but uh, if anyone has any feedback on things that may be missing or you were expecting to see that you didn't, uh, it would be great to, to have that uh, as soon as possible, if not today. So I'd be happy to hear any feedback if you have any. Oh, and I'm sorry, I missed, I missed one slide, the best slide. Uh, this, is the, um, this is the new layout of the, of the ordinance um, that you have in front of you, the different sections of it. And one of, the, one of the requirements is signage, letting folks know that the property is under surveillance. I took this image from Amazon.com, that's a real sign, and it costs $7. So, <laughs> and it meets all the requirements in the ordinance I wrote, so. And no, I don't own stock in Amazon. <laughs> so, there you go. Any questions I can answer, any feedback I can take, I would love to do that. Terry, go ahead. Uh, so when I looked at the compliance state uh, section eight, I guess you were just given the options that we could choose. And I do think it would be uh, fair for everybody and probably more workable that we wait until the uh, December 31st, uh, 2023 or January 1st, 2024. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a good change. Okay. So. Councilman Rotana. Um, I have a couple of things. And Leo, we've <clears throat> talked about apartment safety I think since you got here with, with some of our police officers, um, having lived in one of these complexes myself. Um, but one of the things that I would, um, you know, as far as go, going through all the different elements, I think that um, they're definitely a, a good start to the discussion. One of the things I would want to make sure is that, you know, I think mentioning the 13 and 13 complexes represented out of the 40, um, I think we need to have, um, before we move forward with this, I think we need to have maybe a second meeting and really encourage those other individuals to participate. Um, I, I also think in, in um, when I was working for the city of Dallas, we did the chapter 52 um, overhaul of minimum property standards and we worked very closely with all of the apartment entities like the Apartment Association of Greater Dallas, just so they, there are a lot of their members are part of our city. Um, and so having them make sure that they have a seat at the table to talk about, because they've worked through these ordinances also um, for a number of cities as well, including the city of Dallas, city of Richardson, city of Plano. Um, and so really would, would like to see what, what they have to say as far as what they've worked through, because one of the things I would say, for example, on signage, I mean, there was one with Dallas, they wanted, you know, 20 different signs all over the place. And a lot of times that deters folks from even wanting to rent at that facility, especially how big the signs are. It makes it seem like, oh, well, is there a problem in this property? And we also don't want to, from a business perspective, we don't want to deter folks from not wanting to move here in our city thinking that it's, you know, high crime and whatnot. 
Um, and so I would like to explore just having a, a second meeting and maybe reaching out um, a little more extensively to the other apartment complexes, um, just so they're aware that this is even going on. Um, because I think we'll get both, right? Like you said, we'll get some that it may be too expensive, some that are like, you know what, we're already doing it, won't take much time. Some that actually testimonials that we've heard when I was meeting with the police officers saying, you know, it's actually been a great deterrent, right? Mm -hmm. um, but but you have, making sure we have everybody's input, but then also having um, you know, partners and members like the Apartment Association just to weigh in and get their thoughts since they've worked on these policies with municipalities for a number of years, um, just to give everybody an opportunity to weigh in. Um, and then as far as, and also to have a, a clear understanding for me of what the cost would be for something like this. Um, is there options, right, when it comes to, um, you know, the, the gated communities, making sure that, okay, if, if they're, like for example, in my district, Cook's Creek is a perfect example. They're not gated, they're not enclosed. For them to be able to abide by this, they would need to really truly invest. And, and so trying to see what other avenues do we have to help mitigate cost, um, whether it be from you know federal, county, whatever perspective, and really explore some of those. And maybe some of these partners can let us know, oh, by the way, there is a program or something like this that we'll be able to tap into. Um, and then also to, to let folks know the, the fact that you know, looking at the numbers, because again, people don't know what they don't know, to, to really prove this is really not that expensive if you do the minimum. And what does that minimum require? And I would like to see, and this is something that we did in Dallas too, is, is the in A, B, and C. This is the maximum number, this is the maximum security measures that we want an apartment complex to take. This is plan B, if we lack in these three areas, and this is plan C, right? Um, only because, again, I, I want I want us to make sure that our, our apartments are safe. Um, I want to make sure that we have the mechanisms in place to deter crime. I've had incidents myself as an apartment dweller, um, and so, and I know cameras can be a determinant, right? But at the same time, I don't want to burden the cost of it, because apartments are going up. I mean, I think a two bedroom on the west side is 2200 minimum. Um, and what I would hate to do is to put that burden on, on, the, on the renters, right? So how can we find a happy place? Um, those are just the, my, my suggestions. Um, and, uh, and we have a, a good contact with, um, with folks, on, with member organizations, because um, I, I would love to hear their thoughts. And then also maybe having another meeting with those that didn't attend and maybe do a due diligence to try to make sure that they, they are aware of what's going on before we move forward and can maybe have another if we could, after getting some of that feedback, I'm um, having another study session discussion to talk about this. But but thank you so much for your work. I know we've been talking about it for a while, mm -hmm. so I really appreciate it. Okay. Charles. Uh, Leah, when you went through the process of inviting the apartments to attend this meeting, what did you, how did you go about doing that? Um, we keep records of every apartment complex because they all have to be licensed. So I emailed every owner and every uh, manager that we have on record, and then we mailed a letter to every owner and every manager to their address of record. So we, we tried both ways, and um, they got multiple reminders. We had an RSVP that I gladly ignored because people were signing up even after the RSV passed. I said, sure, come on in. <laughs> so um, so um, uh, I, we tried multiple methods to encourage as many as we could to, to join us. Um, so yeah. you've, you've, just the previous presentation, we talked about the crime statistics for apartments, and that's for one year. <laughs> if you go back further, you'll find that the majority of crimes in the city are in apartments, especially the property crimes that we're having. It's a serious problem. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that when Leo was evaluating what to put in this uh, ordinance is we looked at, okay, what are, in um, communicating with the police department, we looked at what are deterrents. We also looked at, at other cities, and quite frankly, what you have in front of you is probably the most aggressive ordinance that uh, any city has. Dallas, if you've been reading the paper as of last week, they've admitted they are failing on apartment horribly. <laughs> and, and, and they're looking at doing something more strict. What they're looking at doing something more strict with is not as strict as the ordinance you have in front of you. Um, so we're, we're attacking it in a very significant way. Uh, Realizing that access control it, it can be expensive, we made sure to craft this ordinance that if you have a, 
a, an outdoor parking area that access control. We realize that that would be an expensive endeavor to gate and to have access control on a sea of outside ground parking. So this does not require that. If you have structured parking, it's going to require a gate. Many of our new apartments already have that. Uh, in terms of the video surveillance, that's probably you know a critical thing that if there if a if, if some kind of a, a act, criminal activity occurs, that provides good evidence. I'll be honest with you, as Leo had mentioned, the the that we've looked at the cost of those systems, they've plummeted. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can have a really good video surveillance system for well under ten grand for a fairly large complex that just has a loop where it, it has like three days worth of coverage and then it starts recording over it. So we, we try to weigh the cost uh, versus the significance <laughs> of impacting the crime stats. So um, yes, we can have more meetings. And, and yes, we can talk to other cities. And yes, we can talk to apartment associations. But the question is what is, in my eyes and staff sizes, what is right? What is right to help correct the problem we're having because property crime has got to, we've got to take some degree of a dent in that and, and we believe this is the way to do so um, so I, I throw that out that uh, that you know yes we can talk to other folks but what you're going to find is this is more uh, aggressive than anyone else and so mm -hmm. if we're trying to do what everyone else does we're going to be degrading this ordinance. no and I, and I agree with you and, and I think like I said as someone who had property stolen and vehicles <laughs> stolen myself, you know, in an apartment complex, I agree. I just want us to make sure we do our due diligence to have everybody at the table, make sure that everybody, right. I think that message is important, that everybody, every every manager has that message ingrained in there because for us, we, we go above and beyond. We don't do the minimum. We go above and beyond when it comes to making sure that our community is safe and, um, and just doing our due diligence to make sure we have everybody at the table. At least that's important for me because I know I would want to have a seat at the table to make sure that we know what's going on. Um, but no, I agree with you. I think that we need to do something. Um, and that would, that would just be my recommendation is just to, just to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to understand and comprehend why this is so important um, and have some of those organizations um, who have been partners with us in the past to be able to, because I would like to hear from them, why or why not? That way I as you know a representative and, and us, we can have all of the information. So when folks ask why we did this, we know this is why, this is what hasn't worked, and this is what we feel like is gonna work for us in the future. Yeah, and you know, to be honest, I'd only heard from one group before today. And what seems to get people's attention is an ordinance is up for discussion mm -hmm. uh, to be passed and then everyone perks up. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I don't think a second meeting's, um, you know, too bad of an idea just to see if anyone else, you know, wants to show up, have that meeting. Uh, I don't think the dates that we've proposed here need to change in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, when to get in compliance because a lot of people have seen this now. They know what that looks like. And I think over a year and a half is more than enough time for people to work this into their budget and, and get that going. And to add on to what Charles said, the way I read this, you know, your Cook's Creeks, your La Ventanas, your Village Creeks, you know, those apartment complexes aren't going to have to put in these, you know, security measures for their, their streets and parking because they don't have the structured yeah. parking. So, and, and to be honest, I think it's fair that we're doing that because those are the complexes that are most sensitive to rate hikes. Uh, so I think it is being good stewards of not only their dollars, but protecting the residents as well. But, you know, in, in terms of what Leo and the team has proposed, you know, I too agree that, you know, they don't need to be police officers, nor are we asking them to. This is more for data collection, and, and we've emphasized that. And what I've kind of seen in, in, in front of us isn't, you know, I don't think it's too, I guess, too much on the apartment complexes to, to take this approach and maybe up their standards. And the good thing is a lot of this, too, is designed for every apartment complex going forward, yeah. that this is the new standard. They'll build it in. You know, this other cities have done this. And to be honest, if this is more strict than Dallas, then I'm glad we're doing it that way. Just, just my two cents. Uh, I'm going to go to Tracy, then David, and then Terry. Did you have another comment? I'll wait. Okay. I'll, I'll, um, I'll throw us all up underneath that bus and volunteer. Uh, the council as a whole, um, if you'll give us those contact, that contact information for the apartment complexes within our district, I don't think it'd be too much to ask for all of us to take our little sections and make some direct phone calls and say, hey, we've got an ordinance that we're about to pass. We'd like to have you at a meeting. Um, and that also gives us the opportunity to make those um, 
those contacts so that we can go and visit since that seems to be important to them as well. I know that I know I've had a couple of um, apartment complexes reach out to me since I uh, since I joined council asking me to come and tour the uh, facility. So I'll be happy to throw us all in that. <laughs> so um, so that maybe we can help um, get that attendance up so that if we are going to have a second meeting that that it at least be beneficial and we're not just hearing from the same 19 people that attended the last one. Councilman Merritt. Uh, just a quick question, and maybe this is for a little bit of Mark and a little bit of Peter. Uh, with the language related to the security cameras, I didn't see they needed to be in good working order or fully functional. I did see that they needed to be recording of images for 24 hours. So I know I'm slicing hairs here, but if we put 10 up, and the one that you really wanted was down, mm -hmm. that's not serving its purpose. So uh, we do talk about it in the access gate that it needs to be functioning. So I, I think we need to just look at how that it catches. And we so. can, um, if I may, just respond <coughs> quickly. Um, this is going into Chapter 56, the Property Maintenance Code. Um, so property, uh, excuse me, Chapter 56 covers external objects of all kinds That's and how true. they have to be in good condition and sure. so on. So they could be caught under there, right. but for the sake of consistency, since we put it under access devices, I, I think you're, in you're right. We might as well put it, put it in there, clear. too. In yeah, there's no harm in that. And um, uh, also, in, in case you're unaware, but every complex gets uh, inspected every year right. as part of the rental um, registration program for, for apartment complexes. And so if this gets approved, it will become an inspected item. Right. So we, one of the officers will go in and say, I would like to see footage from two days ago, please, uh, uh, that camera. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if all is well, we should be able to see something. And of course, we can't test every camera, but this is something we will we will do our best to, to keep an eye on. So, just FYI, that was the plan too. But it, yeah, we can certainly add that. It's, language. Sir, it's written in there that mm -hmm. it has to catch it twenty four hours, seven days a week. But mm -hmm. I think it's that good operating because mm -hmm. you could have multiple cameras, and if one is down, I'm still recording. It. And I don't think that's the intent. Um, I think we want all ten cameras in my simple example to be working. Yes. So. I agree. The, the one that breaks down is probably the one the police will want, right? Correct. So, yeah. So, okay. <laughs> Murphy's Law. Murphy's Law. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> Councilman Merlin. Um, so, I'm very supportive of this. I, I hate when we sit here and compare ourselves to Dallas because I see Dallas being the, the bare minimum standard. And what I see coming out of this is that uh, we're trying to help businesses make themselves safer for residents as well as the general public, number one. Uh, and when businesses are safer, and this, in this case apartment complexes are safer, then that should translate to better tenancy, in the long run higher, maybe higher rents, who knows, uh, certainly maybe a more stable tenant base and people aren't going to be leaving because they said, oh, we're just overrun with crime here. And it helps give our city a better reputation in the long run. It helps our overall crime and our officers can spend their time doing things elsewhere that they need to be doing. But flip side of that, density always brings problems and uh, or problems always follow density. <laughs> and. Uh, so I, I, I hope that even if we do have second meetings with uh, the uh, managers and owners, that we don't go back on any of this and, and look to soften this. This is where it should move forward with. We, we can take the tone, uh, if you like. The, the first presentation was very open, very fluid. Nothing is written in stone. We want your feedback. That's how the first presentation was delivered. Uh, if you prefer the tone of the next presentation, it could be a little bit different, that the council has reviewed this, they support it. Uh, if you have feedback, we still want to hear it, but this is the direction we are now heading in. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we can make it a little bit more pointed sure. if that's the tone you'd like me to take. Well, and to that point, if, if a manager brought up some significant issue that was going to prohibit them from being able to adhere to this, 
then maybe that could be addressed one off or, or individually. But generally speaking, I would support this. I so, and I, don't, I can't speak for everybody else. But. Any other questions? Leo, do you have what you need? I do, I do for now. Cool. Yeah, you may see me again as always. As always. <laughs> Looking Thank forward to it. <laughs> Actually, before you leave, would um, the next one, the next conversation be a study session as well after we get feedback, I'm assuming? And then we go for, okay. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Thanks, Leo. Thank you. A5, receive a report outlining on street parking regulations for oversized vehicles and a proposed amendment to Chapter 82 creating truck routes and expanding parking prohibitions. All right, good afternoon, Mayor, Council. I'm Jay Siegel, Deputy Chief of the Police Department. And I'm here to queue up the conversation on oversized vehicles, so parking. What I like to say is I don't know what's in those boxes, but if it's caffeine, dig in now. <laughs> <laughs> so the goals of this presentation are to review what the current ordinance states, talk about its limitations, discuss solution options, and ultimately solicit the council's direction on how you want to proceed. So chapter 82 of the city ordinances is what governs traffic and vehicles. And article three under that chapter governs the general prohibition and the residential area parking prohibition when it comes to oversized vehicles. So your general prohibition is in 201 and 202 where it's unlawful to park, stop, stand, or drive a motor vehicle over two axles or a motor vehicle that has two axles combined with a trailer over 18 feet in length in this area described. And it's more simple. That area described is right here, this square. So it's between Denton and Midway and the north and south city limits. So you're not allowed to drive a motor vehicle as described in that ordinance in this area. Accepting distribution way where it connects to Denton and Valwood Parkway and then the exceptions or the defenses to prosecution for that particular ordinance is if you're in a motor vehicle and you're driving to or from delivering services at a residence, a business, or a lot within this area. And also, which is accepted and part of the exceptions, is this area right here where you see in red, and that's Garden Brook, Towerwood, Enterprise, Trend, and Venture as they're accessible from Beltline Road. And the terminology used there is vehicles legally domiciled there. Great term, I like that, legally domiciled. But that's a commercial area I think as many people know, it's there's a lot of trucks that go there. So that's the general prohibition. Whoops. Oh, oh. Great presentation. <laughs> Thank you, I'll be here all week. <laughs> And so for a more specific prohibition, when it comes to residential areas, we have 221. So the prohibition here, it's unlawful for any person to park a truck over three quarter ton in weight or any trailer upon any street in a residential area, except for the purpose of loading or unloading the truck or trailer, or except if you have a 24 hour permit. And I've got the definitions down at the bottom there. The trailer means every vehicle over 18 feet in length with or without motive power. That's important because that's gonna cover your delivery vans and your box trucks and stuff like that and designed for carrying persons or property, which is obvious. Um, one thing to note, this does not cover by ordinance boat trailers or mobile homes. And then residential area, this is a really important aspect of this particular section, means areas zoned as single family or apartment district under the comprehensive zoning ordinance of the city. Your exceptions to this more restrictive parking prohibition. Pickup trucks or passenger vans used for personal non-commercial purposes with commercial, without commercial advertisement rated one ton or less. And then vehicles parked directly adjacent <coughs> to a construction site which are necessarily part of the con construction process. 
Okay, for the police department to enforce these ordinances or any laws, we have to meet the elements of the offense. So we have to ensure that the vehicle is a vehicle as described in the ordinance, and then the location is a prohibited location as described in the ordinance. So at issue here is we have this general prohibition in 201, and it doesn't include areas west of Denton Drive or east of Midway Road. Important to note here is this particular ordinance was written in 1984. So it hasn't been updated in 38 years, and you can see obviously it hasn't kept up with the growth of the city. The city's far east and west sides are the areas that are having the most issues with oversized parking, and they are zoned as planned development districts and not as one family residence or two family residence or multifamily resident. And therefore, these areas don't meet that narrow definition under 221 of residential area. So we can't address it that way as far as enforcement. So what do we do about this? The solution options, there's, there's many of them and they're not mutually exclusive. So depending on how the council wants to proceed, we can do one or multiple to address the issue. So we can revise the definition for the prohibited area to include those areas that are not now included. We can revise the residential area definition to include new residential areas. And something like that, other cities like Carrollton, for instance, they have a prohibition for certain motor vehicles citywide on any public street. <clears throat> um, other cities like Richardson, for instance, they prohibit certain oversized motor vehicles from sundown to sun up citywide on all public streets. So that's something to consider. Post parking prohibition signs is deemed necessary, and we do that on an ad hoc basis now. So look on the west side at Miralago Boulevard, Laga Vista, the eastbound LBJ service road, those have signs on them. On the east side, off the top of my head, we got Simonton Road that has no parking, same thing with Gillis. So, or we can establish and or establish a truck route ordinance. And in your materials, you have a draft of that, of an ordinance that we put up as an example. And in that ordinance, here's this map again, it basically would do the same thing as the current prohibition, but except for the language in this one, it says this is where you can drive if you're one of these oversized vehicles that we define. So if you look at the map, so here's where you can't drive now, and we're saying you can't here now. So that, that excludes all this area, but also this residential area here on the west side. And I'll point out here Crown Drive also because we've got these residents on this side, and we receive a lot of complaints up there from Crown regarding the traffic. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Landmark Boulevard and the northeast side of the city. Questions and comments? Okay. Councilmember Tana. So I'm actually very excited about talking talk about parking because this is something we've been working on for a couple of years now, um, especially on my west side. Um, so I guess my question to you is, from an enforcement perspective, because this is the question that we've had, I've had with PD over the last few months, especially with the large trailers um, on the west side specifically, mm -hmm. what would make things easier from an enfor enforcement perspective out of the options that you gave. Um, you know, is it letting folks know where they can versus where they cannot? Um, you know, I would probably deem it that would probably be the best. I think if we can do as much as possible to make sure there aren't any gray areas, I would personally prefer that. Um, again, because we, we are having a, a lot of issues, um, especially in um, on the west side related to these large vehicles. Um, so I would love to hear, you know, what, what are your thoughts on the best, which mechanisms are best to ensure they are enforced, but also make sure that folks know, and there's no shadow of a doubt, what they are and are not allowed to do. I agree with you. It is an issue on the west side. I see the complaints on a daily basis in my <laughs> office. And the answer to your question is, you know, we want to be agnostic on that from the PD perspective. And, you know, we want to enforce without fear or favor anything, but the simplest language, the better. If you read some of these ordinances, this was an overview of it, and I tried to make it as simple as possible for my own benefit, too, because you start reading all these legalese and all these cross-references and stuff, it gets confusing really quick. So it may even behoove us to take a look at the entire chapter and say, okay, what's good and what's not, and present it to council and say, mm -hmm. look, we want to throw this out and keep this specifically when it comes to the definition of vehicle, right? Mm -hmm. So when we're enforcing it, and that's what I brought up, is what are, we, what are we as a city gonna consider an oversized vehicle? 
You know, is it going to be three quarter ton? Is it going to be one ton? Is it going to be what is going to be the tra trailer length? That's something that an officer has to know whenever they go up there to enforce that. And that's an issue we've had because from a common sense perspective, we've had officers go to the west side and, and look around and say, I am obviously in a residential area. This 18 wheeler should not be parked out here. I'm going to write a citation. Well, then we get it back and we say, well, you're right. And that was definitely a mistake of the heart there because you're like, man, I want to help these folks out. But then you look at the ordinance and it doesn't cover it. Yeah. So. Yeah. I don't know if I answered your question, but you I did, certainly did, hope I did. did. I think I think that's and, and, and thank you for that. I think simplest way possible for folks to interpret that, um, I think is better. Uh, I think you kind of answered my next question was related to the definition of a vehicle, because we are also have we're having obviously the trailer issue, which mm -hmm. is the you know eighteen wheeler double axle. Um, then there's also the issue of the box trucks that are staying there for days, um, and so. You know, as far as the definitions go, currently right now, um, they are allowed, right? Because we have not extended the ordinance past, you know, I think what Denton Drive or Correct. To the West Side. Correct. Okay. They are not covered currently there. Right. But on the the in the current ordinance, they are within the residential residential areas. Correct. Yes. They have, if they are zoned, as discussed earlier. So anything on in the interior of the city, yes. Yep. Okay. Unless another sign prohibits it. Sure, and okay. those are the ad hoc right. ones that we that we've talked about. Correct, or there's weight limit signs. For instance, going north from Valley View to Beltline on Marsh, you can't have an over three quarter ton. Where the general prohibition is, two uh, more than two axles or two axles with a trailer eighteen feet. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, no, and, and I I think taking those measures to go through, make sure we know exactly what the vehicle descriptions are that are allowed and are not allowed especially not just with the 18 wheelers, the box trucks, the large trucks, because um, it's becoming more, it's becoming a huge safety issue um, in some of those residential areas. Um, yes, thank you. And so um, for, and I've seen these all over the West Side. Um, so for, for the, the ordinance itself, as, as long as it's a personal use for, for example, the, the vans and whatnot, those are allowed. But if it's a commercial use, Obviously, those aren't allowed. So anything, anybody with a business or something like that, those are currently not allowed, and we're extending it to make sure that we won't, wouldn't allow the same on, on the areas that weren't a part of the original ordinance, correct? Correct. Okay. And my suggestion would be we bring some of that verbiage back to you all to review yes. and say, okay, look, this is what we're defining as a motor vehicle yes. for the prohibition. Because obviously, we want to do the best for the citizens and also the businesses out mm -hmm. there. Because yeah. there are businesses that are using these vehicles. Mm -hmm. yes. Now, a lot of the That's problems right. that we see from our businesses perspective are people right who are living maybe in an apartment complex and they're a truck driver and they're parking their truck in somebody's neighborhood. And then the reason why it's, you know, it's not always there is because, well, then they go cross country in their truck or something like that. So we see, we see a lot of that. It's like this, the, the same vehicle. And, and it's a frustrating endeavor. Yeah, and, and I think that the from the from the commercial perspective, having those that language that says unless you're loading and unloading, which happens within within our industrial area, and then I think you all did a good job whenever when looking at the map, describing which areas have those industrial and commercial businesses to make sure that they um, we don't deter them from being able to do to to do their business. Some of them have been there for 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 a really long time. Um, I think that the, having the map and having that visual definitely helps. Um, because in, in studying it, the ones that didn't have the red were definitely places that we wanted to make sure that folks didn't drive through because of they were deemed residential. But then in the red, I think y'all did a really good job of capturing where those commercial entities would need some of those bus routes. Um, that, that's all I have for now. I'll let the rest of my colleagues weigh in. Thank you. Okay. That's Marilyn. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Jay. I, my point that I had written down was uh, show definitions of vehicles and trailers okay. and, and uh, show examples of the sizes and axles. I've so, got a couple more. Let me go ahead and show it since okay. I put them on there. Because uh, I think that's important for us to see. Yes. The other thing is, and it sort of came to mind as I was listening to this, what about like uh, uh, people that are moving with U-Haul trucks? And I, I know we can sit here and think of a whole bunch of examples, but that seems to be sort of common when people are moving and maybe it's nighttime, they're not gonna go return the truck to the next morning. Is that something that's... Uh... So the, the way that is handled right now, and I, I think it's more of an education for the citizens out there is you're supposed to contact the police department and get a permit to do that, to say, hey, because 
unloading and loading or servicing somewhere in the city is allowed by the current ordinances, mm -hmm. but it says you can't just park, you can't park in a residential area. However, if you were to, you can get a permit for at least 24 hours. And so you fill out the documents, say, hey, look, I'm, you know, unloading this whole house. I think we actually had a, a situation like that recently on golfing green where that they were they they were moving and they had their the truck parked out there for more than a day um, so if you get a permit then that would cover that if we wanted to keep that in the ordinance okay uh, all righty then uh, the second thing that comes to my mind I'm just trying to think of things that people see or that I've seen that sort of stand out and I'm want to figure out how to address it um, there's a plumbing company in town they also, they live here, they work here, and they live in a uh, area one way in, one way out, uh, and it's a big <coughs> box commercial type truck that's parked there, but then they also park it over at the shopping center when it's not being used, so. Oh, okay. And that's, that's an interesting comment because I've also seen ordinances in other city that prohibit that kind of parking in public and private parking lots. So, I mean, that's, that's something that could be considered. I, I don't know. I, I'm just, I mean, I'm saying, yes, it could, if that's what you are asking us to do. Well, I, can, I, I, I think the neighbors, right. from the residential standpoint, would probably be fine to see it moved right. or not there. Uh, but I understand the vehicle also acts as a rolling billboard, if you will, because right. it's got logo and signage on it. Sure. Uh, but it's a big box truck. And then when it's... Sometimes it's it's just parked for the weekends and whatnot over at the Josie Village. So, you know, is, is that something that would be addressed by this? or That's not anything that would be addressed by this, but I think we could look at it as, as what I'm saying, is because I think it is addressed in other ordinances that I've seen. And I'm not suggesting that it is. I'm just asking Correct. the question. I, I hear you. Okay. Um. As it relates to the map, if you can go back to that. Are you able to zoom in? You know what? I think there's a bigger, give me a second here. You're going to shoot my wheels off here, Mayor. I've had my caffeine, so I'm revved up. That one's a little bit bigger, and I think that's a... Basically, um, Basically, what I'm looking at is the red line that goes east on Valley View from 35. Okay. Denton Drive to Havenhurst and Denton Drive to Farmer's Branch Lane. I would prefer okay. to see that removed. If we're going to be doing a road diet on that street and make that more walkable, I would not want to see truck traffic on those streets. And it's just as many turns on Havenhurst as it is at Valley View. So you, if I heard you correctly, didn't drive going north from Havenhurst? No, no, from Valley View to Havenhurst. The and then from Valley View south to Farmer's Branch Lane. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Okay. And then Valley View as well. So the didn't just removing the So this L right here that I'm tracing, I mean, if you yeah. can see that. Chief, can we regulate that since that's not our road? It's not our road, but we get to take lanes away. Should I ask the question, since it's a county road, can we regulate what goes on? Is it a county road or road I, I just don't know that, but I throw that out. Hmm. But we'll have to check. Yeah. I can't imagine it's still a county road. It is. Yes. Yeah. You're talking Denton Drive? Well, then eliminate, uh, we can ask eliminate Valley View. <laughs> and then they'll have to come from Dallas. Okay. I'll write that down. I mean, if we want that to be a more walkable, vibrant area, we should try to minimize truck traffic as much as possible. I can't see why they need didn't drive in. I'll check that. I don't see any reason why we couldn't yeah, prohibit travel on the county road, but it's... I mean, this is just one person's street. opinion. Y'all might have a completely different one. Maybe we want the trucks there. I don't know. It makes it, no, it the, makes the whole idea of the truck out is to have your grid, north, south, east, west grid, and, and then they take the shortest practical route to make deliveries. Now, that doesn't deal with the oddball vehicles and, and residential areas, but ideas have a, a basic north-south-east grid 
that's reasonable. And whereas we've got a lot of streets on this so-called truck route, the primitive areas is functioning is like a, a truck route. And we can edit this because right now, if you look at the chart and the materials that you all were given, there's 53 streets, 53 streets on there. Yeah. So, uh, we just we were just trying to cover what was already in the prohibition from the flip side by saying you can drive on these. And Chief, the, when you say you can drive on it, you can also park on it. That's yes. Is that correct? Yes. And what prohibits you from parking on Valley View right now? Probably just the overwhelming amount of traffic. <laughs> right, because there are sections of Valley View where people do park on it, specifically between Webb Chapel and like the Templeton area. If you see people that they're going on the westbound, yeah, yeah they do park on it. But Whereas if, you, if you have the truck route, then you, you can't park, stand, or operate off that truck route except when making the delivery. I think that's that's part that needs to be probably part of the discussion moving forward. Sure, as well. it needs to be clear. Yes, regarding yeah. not just driving through it, but also parking along there. That's right. And Absolutely, and actually, the current ordinance does a good job of delineating all those. Yep. It's it's driving, parking, stopping, and standing, all four. Exactly. So, right. And one thing too, I would like to add as part of the discussion is making sure that we sunset this and and not wait so long to <laughs> to to go over it. But ev maybe every three. Uh, three to five years or something like that, much like we've done with all of the other discussions, just to make sure that we know that every three years, we're gonna look at this and see, is there new development? Is there redevelopment? Because now we're looking at redevelopment. What does that look like? Is Are things going from, you know, somewhat commercial to potential residential, residential and, vice versa. and vice versa, yeah. No, I think it's a great point. It also catch unintended consequences. Exactly. Something that we may have prohibited, and we're like, oh, yeah. we didn't mean to prohibit mm -hmm. that. Yeah, so. sometimes, <laughs> unless until it's there, we don't know what, negatives and positives it could have. <clears throat> Councilmember Merrick. Chief, can you help me with parking attached to my 18-wheel rig versus not? I mean, that's the problem, or that's an issue. It's not a problem. That's an issue that I see in that northern trail. Right, and yeah. that's a difficult area, too, and that's, that's something I think that we probably want to address. So what you're referring to is people dumping their trailers there. Correct. And, there's and I, can under, I can understand I'm a long haul driver and I want to go somewhere to eat and I don't want to drive my trailer. Right. And I'll drop my trailer there. And we also see it with our, we have at least one business over there that is doing that because their parking on their lot is incongruent with the number of vehicles that they have. Correct. And so they're parking on the street, and their definition of parking is without a tractor trailer rig. Mm -hmm. It is simply the trailer. Correct. And I've seen it in two different locations, <clears throat> and I've shared pictures, images with the city manager. And I understand our current, current ordinance allows them to be there for 48 hours. And so if we're getting into retooling all of this, that would be one that I'd be very interested in. Um, I understand the parking is allowed, those businesses are there, delivery, et cetera, but I'm, I disapprove of the disengagement of the tractor rig from, so it just looks like outside storage from my days on planning and zoning. It looks like outside storage in the public street, which is crazy. I agree, and, I, and my supposition is that's why Richardson has the ordinance they do, because they're saying, look, from sundown and sun, sunset, you can't have any of this on any of these public streets. Right. So this has got to be off the street, and then Carrollton, you can't have it at all, yeah. you know, at all hours. And I'm not sure that we want to, I'm not sure how that would play out, because we want to be accommodating to some of these businesses, sure. accommodating, but at the same time, we want them to follow the rules, and rather than kind of stretch the rules to, you know, a, now, I'm glad we have the businesses there that are, you know, generating tax dollars for the city. But at the same time, if you perhaps have outgrown your space, maybe time to figure out how to do something different. And uh, it's not fair to the other businesses. I've had in, uh, conversations with other business owners with the amount of trucks that are parking their vendors and their patrons 
uh, can't get in and out of those parking along Garden Brook and Towerwood um, safely. <coughs> the traffic speeds, I mean, you have to put, put your nose out there in order to see around these vehicles and it may lead and you probably have statistics that back that up, you know, traffic accidents, fender benders, if you will, or worse. Um, so I, that's really important <coughs> from a safety aspect and from viable business perspectives. Yes, sir, I agree. I mean, and that's why they're called oversized vehicles and the bigger the vehicle, the more obstruction they're gonna cause. Correct. So. Well, and they're parked on both sides yes. of Garden Brook, yes. and yes. they yes. fix that problem because I run a practice right there, um, and they, they fix move, it. They moved down now to Trend. Oh, the, well, they just attach the, so after the 48 hours, every 48 hours, he'll come and attach the rig back to it, and then after a day, he unattaches the rig from it and attaches it to the next one that's across the street and so it's yeah. just a and now they've he moved. just has a rotation absolutely rig. and you could just he's move it inches yes. and it would lose its definition he and he's inches. moved to inches right. and now he's also Correct. moving them yeah. down on venture yeah. and tire and uh trend as well yeah so and we do face that issue I and mean, we do that with signs too when we put them up as you push the problem to the next street that doesn't have the prohibition yeah. so i think this is a good opportunity to try to encapsulate everything sure. at one stop if we want to go that route. No pun intended. Hey. <laughs> oh. Okay. All right. This guy's good. Oh, he's so good. Comedy's free. <laughs> Does anyone have, have anything else? Um, I just had one last thing. And this may be and this may come back when um need to be more uh appropriate next time, but just if you can add it to your notes. I think the education piece is gonna be key, especially with knowing that you know because we have a lot of the box truck issues like the u-hauls mm -hmm. um around a lot of the apartment complexes and some of them are there for days but i think um as we're talking to you know apartment complexes about crime i think we need to also talk to them about these are some of the other reminders that you need to have with your residents to let them know that they need to have a permit in order for them to be able to park um that those vehicles because we do see them a lot around the apartment complex because because people are moving all the time mm -hmm. and it makes sense and i think again they don't know what they don't know but i think education is going to be a key component to this and using and working with jeff on um, making sure that folks know once these changes come about from a business perspective and then also working with our chambers to let them know that to let them their businesses know that this is this is happening or this is even in existence so i appreciate that absolutely Thank you, sir. anything else Thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Next is a six presentation and discussion related to allowing <laughs> murals. Compared to the past two, I think this one is going to be fun. <laughs> um, some of you in, uh, good evening everyone, Shurupa Sen Planning Department. So tonight we're talking about murals, and some of you have seen this presentation last year in March. Um, it's almost exactly the same. So tonight my goal is pretty simple, uh, to get the direction at the end of the presentation and kind of refresh our collective memory on where we were. So right now, under our current regulations and our sign code, we don't allow uh, murals as they stand now. Uh, the case law um, is complicated. Murals versus wall sign implications. We'll talk about that. There are some options that were provided last time. I have them listed again. And the locational considerations, if we are to go that route, where we want to allow murals. So first of all, kind of a past history, if you will. Right now, they're not allowed. At one point, staff brought an ordinance as part of the station area code amendment, where we were proposing to allow murals only within the station area, or PD-86. And the direction was, or the proposal was denied mainly due to two reasons, lack of size constraints, and there was a lack of clarity on sign approval authority. The question raised at that time was, other cities allow this, why can't farmers branch? And also the issue of compliance with federal case law. 
The federal case law that's most significantly impact mural decisions it the, is the case of uh, 2015 Town of Gilbert versus um, Reed. And the main issue that was identified through that case law was uh, signage must be content neutral. So in a nutshell, if you have to read the sign to understand if it's uh, a signage versus a mural, or if your regulations apply to that particular signage, then that's a violation of the First Amendment rights or your free speech rights. There are other cities who do currently um, have sign ordinances that regulate signs based on or murals also, based on dimensional controls, placement, number of signs, how many walls you can have the murals on, if they can go around the corner, if they face the street versus if it's at the back of the building, various ways they do this. And to be honest with you, some of those ordinances might stand the legal scrutiny if they're tested under the strict um, scrutiny. There are three levels of scrutiny. One is the rational basis. <laughs> So it's almost like depending on which kind of scrutiny the ordinance is subject to, um, that's what makes it more complicated. So option one, that is the, from the city side, most easy option that was presented was totally content neutral. You have non-commercial speech, uh, it's artistic expression on, you can, designate a certain areas within the city where you allow these artistic expressions or murals to come up. It can promote um, redevelopment, infill development. It can promote just art or encourage more artistic expressions of the community. In some cases, it uh, follows the historic character or some of the specific unique characters of the town. Some cities do allow dimensional controls or require dimensional controls, that is the size or square footage, the how many number of walls um, that I was referring before. Usually on these, we will, mean, we will not be recommending a city council review or approval. This will more be like a regular permit review or ministerial permit function. And these are gonna stand the strict scrutiny of federal case law because these are content neutral. Option two, um, I believe was the most popular option uh, in many municipalities was limited business content, which is, yes, if a business owner is commissioning this mural, they can have a limited amount of their business-related content. The caveat being, of course, if it's challenged at the court and um, it's basically you have to read the content to classify, okay, this is the portion of the mural that is business related, whether their logo or like in this picture, the Walgreens or something else related to the business. There are several other case laws which are very conflicting and confusing, where <coughs> some cases there was, a, uh, there was a bait shop where they put mural that was showing pictures of sea or like fish and other sea creatures and that stood the scrutiny because it was not a commercial speech. However, there was a case where there was a doggy daycare and they painted cartoons of dogs on their wall. And because the cartoon matched their logo, the court struck down that mural uh, because it was a commercial speech. So this one is option two, where you can regulate the size and amount of the business logo uh, within the mural and still allow the mural to be larger and cover a bigger portion of the building. Option three, this was kind of unique, uh, creative science, which is kind of creativity is the limit. Personally, not a big fan of this one myself, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's also an option. Uh, you can allow anything and everything. Uh, broader regulation, of course, it would be very difficult to challenge because it's the artist expression. We can have city council final approval through recommendation from art and culture committee. And of course, no off-premise business advertisement. We have to be clear on that, that it still can be um, circumventing our existing sign law. So with those three options, um, the direction that I'm looking for tonight is what is the overall goal? 
what are we trying to achieve? If we want to take the direction of allowing murals, um, there should be locational considerations. Are there limited areas? Are we looking at station area, entertainment overlay district? Are we looking at major commercial corridors, master plan neighborhoods? If we are gonna designate an art district and go through the review of our art and culture committee, and of course exclude the single family residential. Also looking at five years, 10 years down the road. You have a new building, are you gonna consider allowing murals on a new wall? And whether that, how that affect the property value and the building's value. Um, in future, say a new tenant moves in or a new business owner moves in, uh, how about removal of the mural? So all those things have to be considered. However, tonight, we are looking at a direction from council. <coughs> are you re purely looking at artistic expression of allowing murals in certain areas of the city? To There is a term that I recently learned is Instagram worthy, which is you allow <laughs> murals and people just come there because wow, it just <clears throat> looks so cool. Um, or it just signifies your town. It has nothing to do with the business and we would have no problem with those. But what is the long-term goal? And that's how we can work with the legal team and find out uh, what ordinance would suffice that goal. That's all I have. Miss Sen, thank you very much. Um, you know, I asked for this to come back one more time because I really feel this is something we should consider. We already have wonderful businesses in the city right now out of compliance. <clears throat> and updating this would bring them into compliance. <coughs> My first thoughts are option number one, um, if we can go back to that. You know, I don't want to be a group up here that tells people what they can and can't do. I truly believe that you need to let artists art. And my thoughts are we allow this on commercial buildings only. That would, I mean, if you look, that would include multifamily properties, um, you know, over in Vitruvian West. You know, they have a wonderful mural on their garage, which I think adds to the character of that building. But I would also look at specific areas, the I-35 corridor, station area, Four Corners, um, Josie and Valwood, uh, and our east side areas that we are looking to engage and, and, and spruce up and hopefully get more activity there, which I believe this will, will bring. And, you know, in, in terms of the only thing that I would add to option one is what's in option three, which is creativity is the limit. You know, I don't want to limit people, but I also don't want this to be advertisement or anything else. So, you know, don't promote your business. Don't make this a signage thing. You know, this is purely about art. And you can find creative ways to highlight your business and things that it does without explicitly saying it. For example, the cow next to a restaurant on the east side that may or may not serve cow parts. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, allowing businesses to get creative, you know, I think... It, it opens up the door for possibilities. And who are we to tell a business owner what they can or cannot do with their property, for the most part? If they want to paint a mural on the wall and it degrades their property value, that's on them. If it adds to their value, great. If someone buys the building, they're probably buying it, knowing that that mural is there, up to them whether they want to get rid of it or not. Um, and so, you know, that's where I would want to see this move is more in that kind of approach of less hands off from the city. We restrict what, like, you know, have general guidelines, and if it works within that, just let them go. Um, you know, the only other thing that I would consider is, you know, do you bring it down to the Art and Culture Commission and let it in there? Um, you know, these are the people that have the background that we've appointed based on their experience, based on their artistic kind of uh, the background, the knowledge. You know, they're probably out seeing a lot more of this. And to be honest, with as much as I've traveled, and as much as I've seen wall art, I've never once been offended. And I've never once been like, well, how, why would they allow that? A lot of times I leave there going, that's really cool. And they've engaged people to do some cool stuff that, as Sarupa said, makes that town a little bit Instagram worthy. Um, granted, I'm not on Instagram, so I'm not taking the photos. But I know a bunch of other people are. Uh, and you don't want to limit that. Because the more that we can get people to highlight Farmer's Branch, in my opinion, the better. So. That's just my two cents on this. Simpler the better. Open it up and high level let the artist start. So with that, I'll open it up to, to council for other feedback. Councilmember Williams. Um, you know, I'm a huge fan of murals for obvious reasons. 
Um, I, the only thing that I would, I would say um, in rebuttal to, to us not allowing businesses to highlight uh, what they do is when we did the joint uh, PNZ meeting to Richardson and we were over at, remind me of the brewery, the Lockwood, Lockwood. Lockwood. Yeah. Um, they're, they're, they did have, they were advertising and it was a brilliant mural. And as a business owner, I could see where I might not invest in a mural that I could not put some kind of um, branding on. Um, you know, if there's a, I, I mean, that being said, I really would hate to see a gigantic mural of, of just a single logo as well. Um, but um, I, I think, you know, as businesses are, are looking at, at murals, if they, if they do their due, due diligence, if you're going to invest in that kind of money, chances are you know, you know better than that anyway. That, that's not going to draw anyone into your business by having just a gigantic blah of your, of, of your um, logo. So um, I, I would have a tendency to want to go with option number two. I don't think that this should be something that's presented to – Council, I don't think council should have oversight. I don't think that a board should have oversight on it. It's private property. So um, I think we're a little behind uh, other other cities in our mural uh, ordinance. So um, I'm, I would go with a combo of option two and option one. And I, and as far as with the where it should be limited, I would not. I I would. I would make it simple. Otherwise, you're going to have to revisit the ordinance every year or two years in order to decide, oh, okay, we've now d changed our art district. Now we've changed this, you know, and so I think you're asking for trouble. So I'd make it citywide except for on residential uh, or single property or single family residential. Um, Councilman William, if I may just add uh, one minor uh, clarification on option two. Uh, if we do if that is the will that if we do go with option two where allowing business content, a business related like logo or some content on as part of the mural, we have to have the size limitation and Pete, correct me if I'm wrong, because otherwise we are circumventing our wall sign regulations yeah. because we okay. right now have size limitations. So, so we're gonna have to marry those up somehow. I feel I feel like you could do that, Pete. I have total trust in your legal ability to marry those things up. Okay. Uh, so this Hold morning on. I had a briefing with our art and culture chairman. And we were talking about things that were coming forward, including murals. And uh, Scott was familiar with the Orlando ordinance, and one and I shared that this morning with Shruba. But one of the ways that they worked on that was that the text can only take can take no more than five percent of the overall mural design. I love that. I think that would go a long way towards protecting our sign ordinance while allowing some creativity and for a business to express what they do without getting around the sign ordinance and just painting their name on the sign. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Valid. Yep. Okay. Yep. Councilman Lynn. Um, so I'm probably about 80% in agreement with you uh, on this. Uh, I don't know that it's necessarily our prerogative or our responsibility to represent or determine, <laughs> rather, what is good art, what is bad art. That's going to be subjective to every one of us. So in looking at this, I read, I, I, I like option one, I like option two, so I'm going to say I'm, I'm option one and a half because there's parts from both that I like. However, um, yes, that barbecue <laughs> restaurant that has the cow on the side of their building, but not their name. As a marketer, I want my name on something. Uh, Eagle Gun Range, for example, has a big south-facing wall that's just an empty spot to put something on. <coughs> they would probably like to put their logo, which is a giant eagle, on there, uh, but they've got to have their name. It's not going to do him any good. He's not just not going to put up art. He wants to put up something that's going to market his business, and I think that's, that's what we need to allow. We have... Uh, somebody could say that the the Zumi building on Alpha, that whole building is not in compliance because it's painted black with a just a white stripe on it, but it, and it has its name on it. It's a black building uh, versus any other color that it could be. Cantoni is a white building and has their name painted on it uh, on Alpha. I don't have problems with that. Okay, 
we need to allow businesses the opportunity to be able to market themselves and ha if I was dry, if Eagle put a uh, Eagle on the side of their building I might drive by and say oh look at that it doesn't tell me what it is now when I get a little closer to the front of the building I'll see the signage <laughs> on the front uh, I don't know, relatively speaking, what 5% of the side of that building would look like to know whether uh, it would have a big enough sign to say whose business it was. Um, so I, I want to allow that. I don't want the council to be put in the position where they're having to approve what is good art or not acceptable art, I should say. And I don't, I, I was thinking maybe we should have this meeting or presentation and discussion with the Art and Culture Committee just to get a, a total buy-in on what's the right, right way to go on this. We can always kick it down to them. So, I, I mean, I really like to hear what they have to say. The other thing I did think about was uh, absolutely no residential art because uh, if you lived on, let's say, Rawhide Parkway, Okay, and you're you're facing uh, the big park area. What's to stop somebody from putting a, a mural on their garage door? Let's say if it faces the parkway, uh, and that could be of questionable content. Well, that's just where you hang your flag. You know, <laughs> that's just where you hang your flag. It's normally what people are doing. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I would like to hear what the. Uh, what those folks, Art and Culture Committee, have to say about this and, and then make a, a decision on it. Okay. Um, we can always kick it down to them. When's their next meeting? Yeah. Do we know when their next meeting Maybe is? Maybe tomorrow. Oh, so oh we'll tomorrow. Be if we can be on tomorrow night's agenda because it's already posted. It's already posted, they, yeah. They've actually, one of the three times we've presented this, they were in attendance and spoke on this, but we could certainly tee that back up. They're very much, very, very, very much in favor of murals. They've been pushing this out. Mm -hmm. right. so. I'd like to see it move. Yeah, yeah I, th I think, if I may, I think the issue is, and Pete said it earlier, is marrying what the sign ordinance is, marketing your building, and we know what that is. We're familiar with that. And now we're introducing art and trying to figure out what the best way to marry. And there are two examples in your deck here. And one is the greetings from Rod Brothers in Oklahoma City, and the other is the Winwood Cafe on the next, on the next one. It's a diner or what have you. Like it might be an option. Walgreens. One. Walgreens. 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 Well, Walgreens. Well, no, there's another it's one. Winwood Walgreens. Winwood Walgreens. Yeah, one. You have another slide with, with a diner, in it. Where did I see it? I think you married some pictures. No, it's on there. Mark you down. Uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. Show option three again. <laughs> this one is only creativity. No, no business content. Maybe I'm looking at something else. But the in, the intent of allowing them to put the sign of the business or the name of the business shouldn't be the predominance of that. The mural. And, you know, the business does have the right to use it as art, not as signage, because they're operating in the sign ordinance as a business. We're trying to manage the art as a separate issue. So it's a little dicey. I like the idea of allowing some percentage, whether it's 5% or 10%, whatever the, and it might be scalable. I mean, who knows? I mean, 5% of, you know, a very small wall is, you know, very small sizing. So, I mean, we'd have to at least allow them that capability. You know, there are other places in the country that we've gone. I know in the, uh, I think it's the Gulch region in Nashville, you mm -hmm. have the giant angel that is a huge Instagram worthy event. And my daughter made us track down there <coughs> to see this particular, you know, just to, see it. Line, just to see photo, it, just yeah. to stand in line for a photo. Mm -hmm. So those are things that we want to create opportunities for in our community. Um, I don't want city council to be an administrator of what is good art or what is bad art. I don't want it to be in that business either. 
but I think we need to allow the businesses to work with the artists to come to an offering that they can do art with some level of marketing of their business, and we'll have to figure out what that is. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, um, I was just going to say, we, we've talked about this. I'm in favor of murals, and I have been from the beginning. Um, I also think that it's a deterrent for graffiti. Mm -hmm. I know there's a wall in my district that I've been talking about for a couple of years, wanting to do something to deter that. Um, and, and it's been proven to do that in, in several of the cities that we've already mentioned. Um, I'm, I would be happy with either you know, a, a one or a two or a quasi in the middle. Um, I would hate to deter businesses from being able to use it, but also not make sure that the entire wall says, you know, Walgreens. Um, but I think um, leaving the, the artistry to the business to make sure that it, it provides itself, it lends itself to some destinations within our city, which I think is really neat. Um, and, and I think very welcome in some of the areas as we're revitalizing some of those areas um, on, the, on the west side, east side, and in the middle. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm in favor of this. Again, I'm happy to continue the discussion on exactly what language, whether it be a one or two or something in the middle, um, and then make, making sure that we abide by the, the signage ordinance. Um, but again, I want to make sure that also, you know, it is a deterrent to some things that we see sometimes with graffiti and, 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 and things like that. Um, so just, and I'm good with going back to arts. I also remember, John, arts, arts and culture was very, very supportive of this. And so um, the first time we brought it up, they were very excited. Um, so look forward to so now you keep on. continuing the... Um, the discussion on the exact details, but I think if we can move forward with some type of iteration, um, I think it'd be really good for, for us. Okay, uh, real quick, and then I'll go back to you, Terry. Um, it seems high level, like the points to go back to art and culture with a combination of one and two, and I do like adding some percentage, five, 10, something limiting that a majority of this is art, and that's what we wanna see. Um, get the feedback from art and culture and then bring it back to us to, you know, maybe it jives with everything we've just said. They're good with it and something we move move forward. But that would be what I would recommend to, to kind of move this move this along and get this on the agenda sooner rather than later. Councilmember Lynn. So I'm, I like to picture things in my mind or just see things, uh, see examples to help me see things a little clearer. Uh, abstract thought or, or want to know if this would be possible. Let's just take the uh, Ace Hardware, okay? It has a south-facing wall uh, that is just a big blank wall. Could a business like that paint a actual hardware store mural, like the inside of a hardware store, on that wall and be considered a mural? I would or is that an advertisement for what is inside? To me, and I'd rely on Pete on helping us on that versus commercial speech and non-commercial speech. And the speech same right question there. go for Eagle Gun Range. What if they just painted a mural of one of their lanes? So, I, and it, these may be extreme examples, but I think we need to sort of right. think right. right now it's a sign. So... I think what we hear is option one and two are a hybrid. Mm -hmm. I think that staff will start working on some version of that so we can figure out how we need to marry up some of the existing terms and factor in any input we get from the Arts Commission, Art Committee. Yeah. And if I may ask for one additional input, um, is council open to any locational restrictions or are we opening it citywide for all commercials? Citywide, all commercial would be my vote. No residential. Okay. Great. Um, no single family residential or duplex or, or any residential. Townhome. <laughs> any residential area. Okay. But that would not include multifamily. Well, I would include <coughs> multifamily. I would, right, I would include multifamily as commercial. Yeah, that, I mean, you're going to have right. a garage. Just not That's what I'm saying. Your traditional single family. Of, right. Single family home, duplex, Townhouse. townhome, condo. We'll be talking about the structure yeah. themselves. Unless it's a high rise condo. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you're already up there, I think I have. Does that, does that work? Yes. yes. Perfect. I understand. Cool. Thank you very much. Next is receive an update on Farmers Branch Night Out 2022.
lots of trouble. <laughs> you know? I listen. Not well. <laughs> Mayor, Council, Ben Williamson, Assistant City Manager, talking to you about Farmer's Branch Night Out, which, according to this proposal, is right around the corner. <laughs> All right. Give me a second. All right, so Mayor and Council, based on our last meeting, a couple ideas came forward from Farmer's Branch Night Out. One of the ones that seemed to resonate with everyone here was two different dates and maybe two different times of day. When looking at this a little bit more closely, we started to come into a branding problem, as it is called Farmer's Branch Night Out, but how could we still achieve success? And so we started looking at other opportunities. So the first proposal for the first date would be the standard model. It's a proven model. It's at a location we've used before. It's an active event where this is what the event would be about, which is celebrating Farmer's Branch. And so it's gonna do the standard model, captive audience, bring people in, incentivize them to come. What we were proposing was the ice cream truck. The residents love this ice cream truck. Everybody loves the ice cream truck. The staff loves the ice cream truck. It's a popular event. People like being there and it's a more intimate setting. So you can have those more personalized one-on-one -on -one conversations. It wouldn't have the defined structure where we start at this time. We have an introductory speaker and go through a list of items. You could go to the topics of interest that you want to talk about. That way you can have those active engagement sessions and also you're not stuck waiting for a certain item to come up in the conversation. The second part was, well, how do we get the other part of the equation, which was maybe a Saturday event, maybe during the day, or even in this case, in the morning. So we started looking at the event calendar for the city and looking at what options do we have that we can synergize off of and use that event's foot traffic where it's kind of a neat opportunity because Fish and Fun isn't just Farmers Branch residents. It's an event that brings people from all across the region. What better way to brag about the city, also reach our residents, but maybe recruit new residents for the future or new businesses that want to look at Farmers Branch through a different lens. So passive structure meaning the event's part of a larger event. This isn't the event we're using the space and the foot traffic that's already there to talk about the city. But then how do I get people to come and talk to you? They see boards talking about a budget. How do I get people to come over there and talk about that? And these other topics, one of the ideas was, well, it's a fishing event. You get custom bobbers for Farmer's Branch. Say, hey, to get the bobber, you have to come talk to me. The bobbers are over here. So those are the two proposals. So we're checking a couple boxes. One is the standard model at night during the week, which we know will work. The other one is, can we expand and capitalize on an existing event that has a lot of foot traffic? So those are the two proposals for the dates, locations, and times. It may seem a little aggressive with April 14th, but it's an event we've done multiple times in the past. As soon as you all give final direction on times and dates, Jeff will work with us and we'll get the message out and the public knows what to expect. The next part is, what are we going to talk about? We have a standard list of topics we typically go through based on some feedback I got. Councilman Merritt, thank you very much for your list. We started looking at the themes that started to emerge with the topics, and a lot of these resonate with the quarterly report you get from Charles about what's going on in the city. What are we talking about? What's of high importance? And so the I-35 reconstruction, that's important to the public right now. It's a sensitive subject is what's going on with the property and how it's moving. The budget's always a great topic to talk about. We have a great budget. Let's talk about it. Big project updates. There's a lot of projects moving through the council right now that are important for the branding and the future of Farmers Branch. Let's celebrate some of those projects and why they are important to the future of Farmers Branch. And you see many of these have been updated already through council, but we'd work with the various staff members to get the most current updates, some great graphics, and put it on boards to bring people over. And we'll put the talking points on the boards, and you will have this ahead of time, so it's not like, hey, what's going on with the solar farm? How much is it going to generate? We'll have those talking points for you. The other part would be economic development's always a popular topic. People want to know what's coming to Farmers Branch. So we'd work with Allison and say, hey, what are the big things on the horizon? And what's great is, you know, Crossbuck Barbecue, that was one of the events in the past. Guess what's here? Red Sticks was in the past. Guess what's here? So all these things are here, and we've talked about them, and it's full circle showing, hey, we talk about these at events. They're on the way, and look, now they're here. But also when you look at these, you get the briefings every quarter from Charles, start to look at the topics, and then our performance metrics. A lot of what we do is performance-based at a very high level, so we can fold that in and say, hey, here's what makes Farmers Branch special. It's not just the quality of life, it's the services we deliver and the quality of services we deliver. With that being said, this was two content slides. Here's the branding ready to go already. We like the theme with the purples, and we've already got this ready to go. But the dates, the times, the locations, the topics, Mayor and Council, looking for your feedback. Ben, thank you. Um, does anyone have any comments or questions, suggestions? Does everyone like what Ben has proposed? 
Councilmember Lynn. I have a question. So when we had the old style events, we mm -hmm. each had our own event and did talk to our constituents uh, in the, I guess, small group format. Uh, doing this, um, who talks at these events? How is that handled? How do residents get to have time with their representative if they want uh, that particular person versus just getting information from other folks? Um, and uh, uh, well, I'll just say it. I'll ask that. Okay, great question. And so part of the challenge is going to be is it, it is a challenge to overcome. But one way to overcome that is the, the way we set these events up, you're not all together, you're spread out to where folks can talk about what's going on. But if you look at the development in the city, a lot of it's clustered in certain districts, not all the districts. This provides each of you an opportunity to talk about different programs and also about what's going on in your district. But again, some of the districts, if you look where all the active permits are and the development that's going on, it's not spread even, evenly throughout the city. And even then, if you look at the topics of interest, some of these don't touch all the different districts. We can do a couple different ways to make sure we spread this out a little bit more, is based on the topics, make sure they're broader. Like the solar farm is gonna be on the west side, district one, but that affects the whole city and who we are. Mm -hmm. We can also set up different poster stops to where, hey, this is the district one representative two, three, four, and five and also pair that with a topic of interest that you would like to talk about. The best thing about it is nothing set in stone. We can move it around. We can check <coughs> at the last moment. We can be flexible and talk about any topic as well. Or we can have multiple signs at multiple locations, so each of you has the opportunity to talk about more than just one topic. So we can be completely flexible to see how to get the foot traffic you would like to see as well, but also allowing everybody an opportunity <coughs> to talk about what's going on. Okay, so my follow-up to that would be, um, what is your metric for measuring success so there's two metrics and i don't have it in this slide the last presentation what i'm usually looking at is how the folks are interacting with each other and it's hard to measure smiles and energy right but that's really what i look for is success is we have great attendance but we also have great interactions between the staff the elected officials and the public the business you start seeing that positive energy because sometimes it's easy to look at everything that's going on, all these agendas, all this information, but look at all the things that are coming to Farmer's Branch, what there is to be excited about, and that's the measure. It's not a great measure as far as, can I put it quantitatively in a report, but when we have the pictures and look back at the events, you never see anybody upset with somebody, yelling, screaming, it's a lot of positive energy, a lot of smiling, a lot of great interactions, and people going, wow, I didn't realize all of this was going on in Farmer's Branch. Terry, what's your definition of success for an event like this? Um, well, I'm not sure since we haven't done it like this before. Uh, what's I, your I definition of success for events that you've participated in? How's that? I think it's how folks engage with uh, their elected officials and staff, whether they have the opportunity to actually engage. And I think that's very important also. I would hate to see that anybody get left out or minimized uh, in this more group type setting. Uh, we had captive audiences, so to speak, in the past when we did the individual events, whether they're at the library or fire station or whatnot, because those people who came, came to those locations for a certain reason, okay? Uh, we're not, Food was a little bit of an incentive, but I think people came because they genuinely wanted inform specific information. So uh, this type of event is a little different, and it, it, I, I just don't want it to be a one-person show. It needs to be spread out so everybody has something of value to try to sure. communicate to those that attend. I, I think this format's fantastic because I think it does lead it so, lend itself to not be a one-person show because we're all there. And so, and that way you have the opportunity, you know, when we vote here on the council, we don't vote only for our district, we're voting citywide. And so it allows everyone the opportunity to then interact with with all of their elected officials. So I think, I think and splitting it up with the where we're doing the more traditional Thursday night at the historical park, that's a huge that's a huge location so we can really spread out in there and then having this that's more family friendly you know the kids can be over fishing and that gives parents a, a real opportunity to come and and talk and maybe spend some time that they wouldn't be because they're chasing you know chasing kids around 
Um, I think I think I think it's a, a great marriage of the you know two different asks that we uh, that we requested from you, Ben. I mean, some of us don't get to vote. <laughs> and so once or twice a year, we need to be that one person show. So I feel I'm really losing a lot of what I get to do sometimes. Um, but no, I would be in favor of it, the historical park. Like everyone take a house, yep. get your audience, talk to your constituents. But are there other avenues to have, you know, our experts talk about some of the things <coughs> that are going on as well, but also allow each of you an opportunity to yeah. share that same good news and your own views on that same news, um, you know, but, you know, and I think you can do the same thing at, at Fish and Fun. Okay. You know, I think spreading everyone out, allowing you that opportunity to fully engage and, you know, have people that are looking to hear from you or meet with you or okay. are your constituents or aren't your constituents yeah. uh, to come talk to you. you. You have that possibility. And that even allows people an opportunity to go around and actually meet each council member and have the same conversation with all of them that they wouldn't have if they had to drive all over the city mm -hmm. to, to get that same interaction. And that's what we found was the hard part last mm -hmm. time was the distance to get from one to another and putting us in more of a central location where we're all within shouting distance of one another, you know, I think is going to make it a lot easier for a lot of people. And I, I do think, Terry, that a lot of people came to the library to see the improvements. They certainly went to the fire station to see the new facility. So that was what was bringing them there. Uh, do I think many people came to see Dave Merritt at the library? I'm not so sure about that. I did talk to people. I, heard. <laughs> <laughs> I did talk to lots of people, yeah. but I don't think they came to see me. But I think if we're able to communicate the good story that we have to tell about our city and we're all present, they're going to understand, you know, the person that I am, the person that you are, and, and have that opportunity to have a dialogue. I think it's really important that we put ourselves out there collectively as a group. I've said that before. I think it's really important that we do that. Now, we're not always going to see the eye to eye on every item, and that's perfectly fine. But I hope we come to you know some medium with the last item where we had one and two, and maybe we're going to come with a 1.5. Mm -hmm. We'll figure those things out. But I think you know this opportunity for the historical park fits the mold of that. And I think we distribute the agenda items, if you will, and have the interaction. Uh, it's going to be a secondary issue to the main event, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so there will be a little bit of a different feel to that. Um, but maybe it will bring other people out to see council and know that council is giving, a, you know, uh, of our time to talk about these things. So. Jeff, it's really important that we have good marketing, mm -hmm. and we've heard, you know, that sooner we can get to, you know, communicating those things is super important. So, uh, you know, I think it's worth trying. Yeah. And, you know, making the effort, and I'm willing to do that. And I think it's important that we gauge, you know, the attendance and, you know, if it's a pin board, you know, I, this is the, my neighborhood. If we go back to the neighborhoods, we don't necessarily tell you what street you are. But give you a pin and show me what neighborhood or what district you're in in a neighborhood. Those type of things. Maybe make it a little fun in that regard, too. And that's just something off of the cuff. I hadn't really. No, and I, I love that. And one of the things I was going to say is I think because we have an opportunity with our constituents, I think we should leverage that. And what is something that we want to know from them, right? Sure. And so having that opportunity, especially with the Fish and Fun, as part of that incentive, get as much information as possible because this is a time where we'll have that are their undivided attention. And so what is that one thing that we that we need whether it's be a communication thing. I know communication is a huge issue. How do you prefer how do you even if it's just how do you receive communication from the city? Okay. That would tell us, hey, 80% of them get it from our paper newsletter. 20% of them get them from our email. I mean, using the opportunity to get as much information as possible that will help us as a council but also staff use that information to really, um, you know, whatever we're targeting, enhance that, you know, tenfold. Um, so I love that, um, providing some type of incentive to get that. Um, and then I think I, I love the idea because it lends itself for, first and foremost, letting people know what's going on mm -hmm. and doing it at the Finchon Fund lends itself to letting as many people in our city. I'm more worried about that um, because I feel like a lot of folks don't really know a lot of what's going on. Um, but then having that other opportunity where, 
that is more appropriate to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations with your elected and not have to go to five different places because I heard that too yeah. because I, 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 I live in Merritt's district but also Tracy has some really good ideas and I want to talk to her about something that she said, right? And so um, I think having that structure it lends itself to, to doing a little bit of both where we get the information out to as many people as possible on what the great things that we're doing but then also we have a more intimate setting where we're able to talk to our constituents. I think, you know, one thing, and, and this is maybe a challenge to you, Jeff, is figuring out how best to communicate all that information because not everybody receives that information the same way. Right. Um, and from a, from a grassroots perspective to an internet perspective, I mean, we have so many different outlets and we've talked about communication for so long. Um, but also, you know, partnering with other entities to help us get that information out. Um, you know, whether it be whatever that may be, and, and we can talk, talk more on, offline about that, but... Um, but anyways, I love it. Great. And we don't know what we don't know until we try it. Yes. So maybe we try it and it doesn't work, but at least we know, hey, we, let's, we know that it didn't work, but I, I don't foresee that happening. But, right. but thank you for awesome. your innovative approach to, to helping us just, um, you know, accomplish what we're trying to accomplish. We'll definitely get some incentives to help people generate the traffic at Fish and Fun. We'll also probably work to create a flyer with the high points from the different talking points to where you're not stuck in one place. If you need to go mobile, you're not, well, we need to stay over here. Go out and meet with the public because I know y'all want to move around as well. We'll create the tools that allow you all to be successful in whichever format you all feel best with that day. So if it's being mobile, you can do that. If it's being stationary, the boards will be up. Getting people to you will create an incentive, whether it's the bobbers and I need to work with parks and make sure they're okay with that. And they'll be like, whoa, 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 we already got bobbers. <laughs> what does that look like to get the foot traffic to come to you all and have those conversations? And then is there the potential for a feedback loop? Because Fish and Fun is going to be very quick interactions. You're not going to have as much time as you will at the historical park. Mm -hmm. We'll work to create those moments to where you can have that quick feedback moment. What is the one question we want to work on during this event if we're talking to, and it may not be our residents, but residents are residents in every city. How do you best like to best hear from your organization? organization or your city what does that look like and if you're a farmer's branch resident that's even a bonus right, mm -hmm. right. but looking at other folks in other cities there should be similar themes can we also make sure we have staff that speak Spanish yes Please. of course and the benefit of especially the one location on Thursday night is you're gonna have a lot of your staff there so if you get some technical questions the staff will be there to help you as oh, well no, but yes we'll make sure we have folks that can speak Spanish as well parking lot board one question you want to ask your city council one issue, you know, and have them be, you see it sometimes on like a prayer board, if you will, they, people will write, you know, their, I'd like to see this. Okay. Well, we did that with the <laughs> library where they had, you know, what would you like to see? What questions do you have? And we just right. had a board with sticky notes. Correct. Yeah. yeah, that'd be good to have an easel with like a big blank sheet of paper and let's just write. Yeah. Everybody can write stuff that they hear from people on that. Mm -hmm. So what I'd probably do is frame this in two elements. What's the one question or one thing you'd like to know more about with the city? Mm -hmm. I also like to put the positive spin on this if you're okay with it and say, what's one thing you really love about this city? Because that provides a lot of valuable feedback to the council and to the staff that are implementing your direction. So if you're okay, I like to balance the two as questions, but also giving that feedback loop of, hey, you know, with our survey, the old format for the employee survey, or not employee, the resident survey, it had a lot of open format questions, but it was incredibly long but it provided a lot of great feedback for sure. police and fire to let the community know, hey, we love you and what you do. And sometimes it's good to have those feedback loops. I'm sure they'll get a lot of positive compliments in this type of format as well. Sure. So if you're okay with it, that's we'll get these ready and yeah. these are the dates. We'll start publishing immediately. All right, perfect. Awesome. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Next is AA discuss future agenda items. Um, one thing I do want to discuss in the future is... Uh, the idea of a hybrid rec center slash library on the west side. Um, I think there's an opportunity to collaborate with the HOA uh, in the city to to come up with something that might you know provide an amenity, an additional amenity over over there. So that's something I want to look up, Councilmember Merritt. With, with some additional electronic uh, electric chargers would be great. So just saying. Yeah. <laughs> I'm okay. Any? Do you have anything else you want to? Discuss? No, thank you. I'm good. Councilmember Lynn. Councilmember Williams. I'm good. Councilmember Ratana. Um, and this may be something that we may have to resort to bringing someone in, but um, talking about some of the funding that's coming for sustainability and things like infrastructure through the infrastructure bill, um, I would love to. That's something that we talked about when, when Tracy and I were out in DC. I mean, there's so much and cities are gonna be able to tap into that. So I would kinda of like to see what the breakdown is from the federal, state, and local perspective and see um, 
uh, get a, because I think it'll be information that I think our entire council needs to be privy to. Correct. Because um, so I think it'll help us with some of the big projects that I know, Mayor, that you're wanting to um, to tackle. And then love the, the West, we've been talking about that for the West Side for a long time, so I love um, bringing that up as well, so thank you. Cool. All right, with that, I will read in executive session. Council may convene into a closed executive session pursuant to section 551.087 of the Texas Government Code to, deliver, uh, to discuss economic development incentives for Project Select, to discuss economic development incentives for Project Root Beer. Council may convene into a closed executive session pursuant to section 551.072 of the Texas Government Code to deliberate regarding, discuss the purchase, exchange, lease, or sale of real property north of Valley View, south of Valwood, east of B, west of Josie. Council may convene into a closed executive session pursuant to section 551.076 of the Texas Government Code to deliberate regarding security devices. Council may convene into a closed executive session pursuant to section 551.074 of the Texas Government Code to deliberate the appointment, employment, and selection process for the city manager. We will recess for about five minutes and then come back in. The time is 420.